Well, amen. Thank you so much. Would you take God's Word tonight and open, please, to the book of 1 Timothy. Uh, we continue studying this book on Sunday night, 1 Timothy chapter 1, and uh, we're going to look at verses 18 down to verse 20 tonight, 1 Timothy chapter 1, starting at verse 18. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went on before thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may ner- learn not to blaspheme. One of my favorite uh, characters in uh, American history is General Douglas MacArthur. And most people don't realize that uh, he was a very articulate speaker. One of the, my favorite speeches that he gave was at West Point on May the 12th, 1962, um, when he was giving a charge to the young soldiers there at West Point. Let me just read you an excerpt of it. He said, you are the leaven which binds together the entire fabric of our national system of defense. From your ranks come the great captains who hold the nation's destiny in their hands the moment the war toxin sounds. The long gray line has never failed us. Were you to do so, a million ghosts in olive drab, in brown khaki, and in blue and gray would rise from their white crosses, thundering those magic words, duty, honor, and country. In those eloquent words there. Now, MacArthur was a very devoted soldier all the way unto the end, and this was a wonderful charge that he gave these young soldiers here. And the reason I bring that up is because we're in a section here in 1 Timothy where Paul speaks more like a a, a general that's giving a charge to a young soldier than a father uh, to a son in the faith. Although we know that according to as we studied, Paul calls Timothy his his true son in the faith. Here Paul is speaking more like a general now, and he says to Timothy, the real thrust of of the whole message is in verse 18 where he says, uh, war a good warfare. There he sounds like a soldier. Timothy, we're in the Lord's army. I need you to war a good warfare. And then he kind of switches from army to navy to make sure navy has some time here. He says in verse 19, holding faith in a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. And so what we see here then is Paul, again, exhorting Timothy. And you understand the relationship that Paul had with him while Paul was out on one of his missionary journeys. He came to the city of Lystra and there preached the gospel That was a place where he was stoned and miraculously God protected him. He was able to walk away from that and later come back again after he preached the gospel there and found Timothy, a young man who had learned the faith from his grandmother and his mother, learned the word of God, but then really put his faith in Jesus Christ as a result of Paul's preaching. And when Paul came back again, Timothy had matured in the faith. And the Bible says many of the brethren spoke well of him And Paul found someone that he could use in ministry, and he began to take Timothy with him on his journeys. Paul at that time was about 50 years old, Timothy probably in his 20s. And so for the next 18 years, until Paul was beheaded by Nero, Timothy was right there serving side by side with Paul, um, his spiritual father. Now, we also learned that Paul wanted Timothy to stay in Ephesus. After Paul was released from prison, from the Roman prison, Um, probably in 62 or somewhere around 62 AD, 64 AD, um, he basically visited Ephesus uh, to make sure things were well there. And then he went on to Macedonia, but he left Timothy there in Ephesus. And the Bible makes very clear what he was supposed to do. Again, in verse number three of chapter one, I I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Part of the duty of Timothy was pretty difficult. He was to stay there and to deal with some of the false teachers that were there at Ephesus trying to get a foothold in the church that were handling the law that really didn't understand what they were talking about. They were bringing in Jewish myths and all these other ideas that really only cause questions rather than godly edify. And so this was not an easy thing for a man who was timid and shy uh, as Timothy was. Uh, We have every belief reason to believe that that was really his personality based on Paul's words of exhortation to him. And so this was not an easy thing for Timothy to do. And no doubt at times he got discouraged. And here Paul is trying to encourage him by giving him this charge 
that he wore a good warfare. And again, this was part of the theme of uh, 1 Timothy, that we guard the truth, that part of what we are called to do as God's people is to be faithful to the gospel, to watch over the gospel, and to guard the deposit of truth that has been committed unto us. And so it's like I said this morning, I guess this is a day for military-type sermons, because this morning I, I spoke on 2 Corinthians chapter 10, where Paul basically talked about the weapons of our warfare that are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And there, in that passage, Paul uses great militant military metaphors and words. And we see the same thing here tonight. Paul, again, is using military language, but he wants Timothy to be inspired by that, to realize that you're in the Lord's army and that you have a charge you have a commitment as the soldier of the Lord to war a good warfare. Or we could say to fight the good fight of faith and not be a casualty. So based on that, I want us to see three ways that we can be a good soldier, that we can fight a good fight. These are the things that Paul tells Timothy here in these verses. And here's the first one. Number one, very simply, remember your duty. Remember your duty. Again, look at verse number 18 of chapter 1. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went on before thee. This charge. And so part of a soldier's duty is to obey orders. That's the first thing I want you to see under this heading. A soldier must obey his orders. The word charge here is a military term, para angelia, which is, speaks of military orders. This is not a suggestion that Paul's giving Timothy. It's not open for discussion. It's a mandate to be carried out. Anyone here has ever been a part of military knows that when an order is given, it's not open for debate or it's not open for discussion. A good soldier understands his orders, and he obeys his orders. Five times Paul uses this word charge, para angelo, which means to hand down uh, like a military order. It must be obeyed. We see it used in verse 3 of chapter 1, charge some that they teach no other doctrine. We see it here used in verse 18. This charge I commit unto thee, we, it's in chapter 4, verse 11, that, where it says command and teach, same word, in 1 Timothy 5, 7, and these things give in charge. All this, these are the same words. In other words, the church has been given its orders, and we have to obey those orders that as they have been given in order to war a good warfare. Understand your orders. And by the way, it's not unclear. The orders are given to us from the word of God. If you want to know what your orders are as a soldier of Jesus Christ, just read the Scripture. And in fact, in First and Second Timothy, what you're going to find is that there's all kind of commands, there's all kind of imperatives that Paul is passing on to Timothy. I kind of listed them here. In First Timothy, stay in Ephesus. Verse 3, don't allow false teaching. Uh, war, good warfare, we just saw that. Teach the church to pray, chapter 2, verse 1. Teach women, chapter 2, verse 11. Ordain qualified leaders, chapter 3. Expose false teaching, chapter 4, verse 6, when he says, put the, uh, uh, the brethren in remembrance of these things, that these things are the heresies that Paul had already been talking about. Be trained in Scripture and doctrine, chapter 4, verse 6. Avoid worldly myths and fables, chapter 4, verse 7. Same myths and fables he was talking about in chapter 1. Discipline yourself in personal godliness, chapter 4, 7 and 8. Work hard, chapter 4, verse 10. Teach and speak with authority, chapter 4, verse 11. Live with integrity, chapter 4, verse 12. Center your life and ministry on the Scripture, chapter 4, verse 13. Use your gift, chapter 4, verse 14. Be passionate, chapter 4, verse 15. Grow, so you get the idea here. That's all in 1 Timothy, chapter 1. Then we can go to chapter uh, 2 Timothy. Stir up the gift of God that's in you, Timothy. Don't be ashamed to suffer, chapter 1, verse 8. Replace fear with power and love and faith. Hold on to truth, chapter 1, verse 13. Be strong, chapter 2, verse 1. Endure hardness, chapter 2, verse 3. Study to show yourself approved unto God, chapter 2, verse 15. Flee useful lusts. And then all the way down to chapter 4 where he says, preach the word. And I've just mentioned a few of them. <laughs> I didn't go over all of them. So you get the idea that this, this is, these are two letters that are just filled with orders. Here's what you are to do. Here's how you are to conduct yourself. And a soldier, a good soldier, 
has, obeys the orders that are passed down to him. But here's another thing. A soldier must remember his comrades. Look again in verse 18 where it says, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went on before thee. Now, prophecies are in past tense, and so the sense here is that there were predictions that were made about Timothy by other believers. Evidently, there was some point in time when maybe this was when Timothy was ordained or perhaps commissioned to uh, ministry with Paul. We can't be absolutely sure of when this was, but there was a time in Timothy's life where there were some who made predictions and prophecies about the success of his ministry. Uh, We can kind of piece some of this together. We know that Paul recruited Timothy at Lystra. The Bible says the brethren there spoke well of him. We know that there was some point where there was an event in which three things happened. He was given a spiritual gift, prophecy was made over him, and the elders laid hands on him. We know this from chapter 4 of 1 Timothy, verse 14. Just look at that real quick. 1 Timothy 4, 14. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. And so, um, very likely, the gift he received was that of preaching, because Paul will encourage him later on in 2 Timothy to stir up the gift of God uh, and not to be given over to the spirit of fear and power, but of power and love and of a sound mind. And so Paul is urging Timothy to do not succumb to uh, timidity, uh, to fear, um, but you are to fan the flame of preaching the gift that you have been given as you fight the good fight of faith. And so there was a time in Timothy's life when the brethren around him saw the gift of God in him and they commended him for ministry and they uh, predicted that he was going to be someone that God was going to use. I think that any young person that is called into ministry, part of that calling is to be affirmed by the brethren, by the church. The church will see that and the church will encourage them in the way. And um, there have been young men called out of the ministry here at Grace and you have seen perhaps gifts of ministry in them and have made the same kind of uh, maybe words of affirmation and predictions about them as Paul's talking here about Timothy. And basically he's saying, Timothy, don't forget the brethren that have put so much confidence in you. Remember that. You don't want to quit. You don't want to be a disappointment. You don't want to give up. You want to basically remember what was said about you when they saw God's hand in your life. Do not disappoint your comrades in arms, those who are watching over you, those who have made such wonderful predictions about how God was going to use you in ministry. In the mid-1840s, there was an evangelist by the name of Richard Neal, and he one day came to a little town called Stamborn, and he prayed for the salvation of a little 10-year-old boy and prayed that this young man would come to know Jesus Christ And a few days later, he sat this little boy on his knee, and he made a prediction. He said, this child will one day preach the gospel, and he will preach it to great multitudes, and many people are going to be changed because of his ministry. Now, that little boy that he sat on his knee was a man by the name of, grew up to be a man by the name of Charles Haddon Spurgeon. And so that prophecy came true. Um, He was greatly used by God. It is estimated that Spurgeon's voice preached to over 10 million people, including politicians, uh, including writers and other Christian workers. Uh, By 1892, Spurgeon had published more words than could be found in the Encyclopedia Britannica. You have to remember, this was before uh, the Internet, (laughs) before mass printing, I guess you could say. His church launched 66 parachurch ministries, including orphanages, ministry to policemen, a book fund, a nursing home, and a clothing drive. His sermons were translated into 40 languages. It is said when they found David Livingston in Africa, he was wearing a hat, and inside the hat was a sermon by Charles Spurgeon. So he was greatly used by God. And so Paul is saying to Timothy, Timothy, uh, there's been things said of you. And remember that according to these, I want you to war a good warfare. Here's the third thing. A soldier must remember his orders. A soldier must obey or remember his comrades, obey his order, remember his comrades. But here's the next thing. A soldier must fight his battles. In verse 18, again, he says this, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. 
Timothy, according to these things, I want you to war a good warfare. The word for war here is a, a, a strategy, oh my, a strategy, oh my. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Strategy, oh my. Probably break up the syllables there. And it's where, where we get the word strategy. And it really just means to engage in a battle, engage in a fight. And so, we, again, he's saying, Timothy, fight the good fight. Fight well, we could say. Don't run from the battle. It's like I said this morning, the Christian life is not a cruise ship, it's a battleship. We are soldiers, and sometimes we have to call, we're called upon to fight the good fight. We have too many believers that have gone AWOL, and they're not engaged in taking the message of the gospel out to the world. They're not fighting the good fight of faith. One time, Dr. Howard Hendricks talked about a time when he saw a young reporter interview Bud Wilkinson, who was at that time the, the, the coach of the Oklahoma Sooners football team. And the reporter kind of with great enthusiasm came to Coach Wilkinson and said, do you think that college football has contributed to physical fitness in America? And the, and the football coach looked at the reporter with shock and said, no. And the reporter said, well, why? He said, well, because I define football like this, 22 men on the field desperately needing rest, being watched by 50,000 people in the stands desperately needing exercise. And then Dr. Howard Hendricks concluded by saying, what a description of the local church. Sadly, Christianity in America is often a spectator sport where you go on Sunday and you watch the pros perform and uh, that, you know, after all, that's what they're paid to do. And that mentality, sadly, is in a lot of churches. But that's simply not biblical. There's no real division between laity and clergy. We're all servants of Christ. We're all priests of God. We're all soldiers in the Lord's army. And we are all to en get engaged and fight the good fight of faith. That's a call for every one of us as believers. And so, number one, remember your duty. But here's number two. Keep a good conscience. Keep a good conscience. Look what he says in verse 19. Holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. Now, the word faith here is a broad word. It includes all of the truth of the gospel. We could say the fundamental doctrines of the gospel. That's all included there. In order to be a good soldier, you must hold on to the truth of the word of God, the truth of the gospel, the fundamentals of the faith. And you have to have a personal trust in Jesus Christ. You have to know Jesus and hold on to the truth, hold on to the gospel. Are you doing that? And secondly, he says this, uh, and a good conscience. Now, what Paul here is talking about is a godly lifestyle. It's not enough just to believe the right things. Um, what we believe should determine how we behave. And if we really believe the truth of the gospel, it's going to affect how we live. And so Paul is saying, look, Keep your conscience clean. Make sure you're living a pure life. A good conscience is the result of a person who's living a godly life, who's confessing their sin, who's walking with the Lord, and they're not allowing their conscience to be defiled in any way, but they're walking according to God's way. Now, what is the conscience? A conscience is uh, really a gift from God. It is an inward moral guide, we could say. I like what Proverbs says. I think it's referring to the conscience. Proverbs 20, verse 27. The spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all his innermost parts. I think that's the idea there. It's this inward light, this inward lamp that reveals us inwardly. I like to call it the traffic light of the soul. Sometimes it flashes red, tells us to stop. Whatever you're doing, stop it. Or sometimes it might flash yellow, a caution, whatever you're about to do, don't do that. And sometimes it flashes green. It affirms us in what we're doing. What you're doing is a good thing. And proceed, do that. And so the conscience has that effect, that inward traffic light that kind of directs us. I like the way one little boy defined the conscience. He said, it's something that makes you tell your mother before your sister does. What did, where did the conscience come from? When the fall came, there came a sense of right and wrong. There came a sense of shame. And so when sin came into the world, the conscience became activated, we could say. It became necessary. Adam and Eve felt 
for the first time a sense of guilt. They felt a sense of shame. They knew that they were naked. They sensed the evil. Their innocence was destroyed. Instantly, they felt it strongly. And they were now capable of all kind of evil thoughts. And they saw sin in a new light. And God gave the conscience as a gift to man to protect man from himself. Man was now depraved. And man now can live out the depravity of his nature. And so God gave the conscience as a, uh, as a, as a, as a gift to keep man from living out the full measure of his depravity. It was given to restrain evil. It was given to restrain sin. And so the conscience is something that if we follow will keep us from going off into a dangerous path. And that's why guilt, although the world today calls guilt a negative emotion, guilt is actually a good thing because it reveals that you have a conscience that is functioning, that, you, that, you, that it works. Someone that can do something evil and not feel any guilt is someone that's in a very dangerous position because their conscience is pretty much gone. It's dead. And so it's, guilt is then as a sign of a healthy conscience. And then the Bible tells us in many places that we need to keep our conscience clean, that we need to function according to it. It needs to be under the power of the Holy Spirit. It needs to be yielded to the Holy Spirit. It needs to be educated by the Word of God. Because your conscience can only function according to the light that you give it. Richard Sibbs, the Puritan, uh, wrote a lot about the conscience. He wrote a book called The Conscience, the Courtroom of the Soul. And uh, he wrote this. He said, To clear this further concerning the nature of conscience, know that God has set up in man a court. And there is in man all that are in a court. Richard Sibbs calls the conscience the, the inner courtroom that God has put in all of us. And so the conscience holds court, and it declares us either guilty or not guilty. Now the question is asked, you know, there are many members in a courtroom. Which member does the conscience uh, represent? Um, There's the registrar who records what's been done. There's the accuser that lodges the complaint. There are the witnesses that witness for us or against us. There is the judge who declares us guilty or not guilty. And then there's the executioner who punishes those that are guilty. And so the question then is, which one is the conscience? And the answer that Richard Sibbs gives is he said, the conscience assumes every role in the courtroom. He's all of those. He's the registrar who records what is done. Did you know your conscience keeps a diary? It sets down everything that you do. Your conscience doesn't forget anything. You might try to push it away, but your conscience will not. Your conscience will register the deed. You can't hide it from your conscience. You can hide it from others, but not your conscience. Sibs wrote that this should discourage us from having secret sins. And then he says that the conscience is also the witness. The conscience bears witness. The conscience was there to see everything that took place. And so um, the witness will be the the one that will witness either for you or against you in the courtroom. Sib said this, the testimony of conscience, the conscience does witness, this have I done, this have I not done. And then he also says the conscience is the accuser. It lodges the complaint. He says this, quote, there is an accuser with the witnesses, the conscience, it accuses or it excuses. In other words, Your conscience will either say that you've done the wrong thing or it will excuse you and say you've done the right thing. Write down Proverbs 28, 11. The wicked flee when no man pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. Someone who has an accusing conscience, they're always running from things. I mean, you talk to them, you say something, they say, what did you mean by that? Well, I didn't really mean anything by that. I mean, they're always paranoid. They're always taking things as if you're doing some kind of a witch hunt against them when you have no intention. That's an accusing conscience. There are things there that, are, that are, haven't been settled. And, uh, and so that's, that's, a, that's a sign of someone who needs to have their conscience cleansed. But then also there's the judge. And Richard Sibbs says the conscience is also the judge. He says, there it doth judge, this is well done, or this is ill done. And then he also says the conscience is the executioner. He writes this, Upon accusation and judgment, there is punishment. 
The first punishment is within a man always before he come to hell. The punishment of conscience, it is a, pre, a prejudice, or we could say a prejudgment of future judgment. The conscience punishes the guilty. And he said that's kind of like a preview of hell. Your, your conscience will punish you. You're, that, you know, that's someone who can't rest. Uh, there's, there's, there's no peace whatsoever because that conscience is tormenting the soul of that person who has done something wrong, who has done something guilty. And so Sib says it's all of those things, all of those things. And I would just add that the conscience is a judge, but that judge has to have the right information. And that's why it's up to us as believers to furnish our conscience with the Word of God, with the right information. There are some people out in the world today, their conscience doesn't bother them because their inner conscience is ruling according to a set of laws that are outside the Scripture. Our society today has got a new set of morals that are, doesn't match with the Bible, and they educate their conscience with these new morals, which is no morality at all. And so therefore, their conscience doesn't work because it's been misinformed. A judge can only make a right verdict if he has the right information. And so that's why we have to educate our conscience with the Word of God. But the Bible speaks about a defiled conscience. In Titus 1.15, under the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. That's why we always have to make sure that we educate our conscience according to the Word of God, that it doesn't accuse us falsely by a set of standards that are not biblical, And that when our conscience does accuse us, that we come immediately and we confess that sin and we get cleansing from the the cross of Jesus Christ, that our sins are confessed and cleansed, and that conscience is satisfied. It's made to rest. But if you don't do that, your conscience can be defiled. The Bible speaks about the dulling of one's conscience or a seared conscience. And look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. In verse number 2, actually we'll start at verse 1, where it says, Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience, what? Seared with a hot iron. That is a conscience that is dull. It's not working. It's been seared. And that leads to the next thing. The Bible speaks about a dead conscience. In Romans 1, the phrase, God gave them up to a reprobate mind or heart, that's, that's, a, that's a, a conscience that absolutely, positively does not work. That conscience is basically dead. People have been ignoring that inner voice so long that that, that whole warning system that God has put inside that person no longer functions. It's been turned off. It's absolutely dead. In 1984, there was an airline's jet that crashed in Spain. The investigators studying the accident made a discovery. The black box recorder revealed that several minutes before the impact, the computer voice spoke to the pilots in the cockpit, basically saying, pull up, pull up. But the problem was it was saying it in English, and the pilots were Spanish. But it kept saying, pull up, pull up, pull up. And all they heard was one pilot say, shut up, gringo, and and turn the thing off. And minutes later, the plane plowed into the side of a mountain. Everyone on board died because they turned off that whole warning system, and they ignored the voice. And that's what some people do. That's how they treat the warning system that God has placed inside of them. They ignore it, or they turn it off, and it's dead. It doesn't work anymore. And if that happens to you as a believer, it's not, it won't be long until your soul will become shipwrecked. That's the whole thing that Paul's saying here. Keep a pure, clean conscience, he says, holding faith in a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. Look at that word put away there. The Greek word is pushed away or pushed to the side or thrust away from oneself completely ignoring. And Paul said, people like this make shipwreck of their soul. It's not long until they will be dashed against the rocks and their soul will be wrecked. And so keep a 
clean, pure conscience. But here's the third thing. Number one, remember your duty. Number two, as a soldier, keep a good conscience. But number three, confront the enemy. Look at verse 20, chapter 1. Of whom, kind of the same thought here, talking about those that have made shipwreck of their faith, talk about those that have ignored their conscience. Of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, who I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Unfortunately, there are times when sinning members have to be dealt with. And those that have abandoned the faith or maybe they're teaching outside the realm, the realm of orthodoxy, they have to be put out. And this is what Paul does here. This is what he's referring to. Just remember this, beloved. Wherever God plants wheat, Satan is going to plant tares. And not everyone who names the name of Christ is truly a believer. And so the Bible says we have to beware. We have to beware because wherever God is doing his work, Satan is going to do counterfeit work. And Satan will put false teachers in churches. Write down Jude 4. There are certain men, for there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. The enemy likes to come in unnoticed. Satan's weapon is stealth. He doesn't want you to see him coming. So he says, they, are there are certain men crept in unawares. You know, when Satan attacks the church, he attacks it outwardly with persecution. He's never really gotten a lot done with persecution because it only causes the church to be purified and grow more. But his second way is infiltration. He creeps in. And the verb, that, the verb that's used here, crept in unawares, it's, it's used nowhere else in the New Testament. It's a compound word, pair up the side, ice into duno, to enter, to enter in the side. And Vincent puts it this way in his commentary, to, to get in by the side, to slip in the side door. This word's used of a legal case where an attorney will slip in an argument in a case. Or it's also used in extra-biblical literature to talk about a criminal who secretly slips into uh, a house or someone who slips into a country which had been expelled. It has the idea to enter in secretly. And so there are apostates, there are false teachers that sometimes slip into a church. They can slip into other religious organizations so that they may do their work they're there not because God put them there. They're there because Satan put them there. And when, that, and when they reveal who they are, that has to be dealt with. There has to be discipline. Now, the Bible speaks about church discipline. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 18. If your brother sin against you, you go to him and you talk to him one-on-one, -on -one, and if he repents, then you've gained your brother. If they don't repent, what do you do? You take two or three witnesses and you go. Why? The whole goal is restoration. You want to bring them back into the the church fellowship. But if they continue on and don't repent, what you're basically saying to them is, okay, we've given you time. We've confronted you over this. You're sinning against us, the church. You're sinning against Christ. Now it's time that you be no longer part of us. And that's a functional judgment from the church. And in essence, what the church is saying is, we don't believe that you're truly a believer. We don't believe you're truly saved. Because if you were saved, you would have repented by now. You would have turned from this sin. But the fact that you haven't done that is an indication that maybe you're not part of the body of Christ, and so therefore they're put out, they're excommunicated from the fellowship. Now there are times, however, that we find in the New Testament when a sin is so great, when it's so heinous, when it's so uh, dangerous, that the Apostle Paul doesn't really go through the steps that are laid out by the Lord in Matthew 18. He just kind of... Uh, uses his authority and says, this person needs to leave. This person needs to go because this was so bad. Let me give you an illustration of this. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 real quick. Just look at this. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Notice what it says there. I probably showed this to you before. In chapter 5, verse 1 of 1 Corinthians, it's reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. In the church, there was an illicit relationship going on. 
a, a young a man was having a relationship with his stepmother, and it wasn't being dealt with in the church. Verse 2, and you're puffed up and have not rather mourned. What's the proper response when sin arises in a church? We should mourn over sin. But here the Corinthians were puffed up about it. They were protecting this guy. They were using different arguments and excuses on why we just need to leave him alone. Maybe this person was someone who was very well known in the city, had a lot of power, but for whatever reason they weren't dealing with it. And Paul basically enters in, look at verse 3, For I verily as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that has so done this deed, that in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glory is not good. Know you that a, not that a little leaven leavens a whole lump? Purge out the old leaven. So Paul rebukes them because they weren't doing what they should. And Paul said, look, even though I'm not there bodily, physically, my spirit is there, and I'm telling you that you put this person out. You purge the old leaven. You put them out. Sin has an effect upon the whole church, upon the whole body of Christ. And so there are certain occasions when the sin is so bad that it has to be dealt with quickly, and that's what Paul does. There are certain times in the Bible when God, and by the way, this is called being delivered over unto Satan because that's exactly the term that Paul uses in 1 Corinthians 5, 5, to deliver such a one unto Satan. And now here in 1 Corinthians 1, 20, he's using the same expression. Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. So Paul does the same thing here. There are times in Scripture when God will deliver someone over to Satan. Sometimes it's with a, in view of a positive result. It's not necessarily punishment from God, but God using Satan to accomplish his work. And how many of you know that Satan can do nothing unless God allows it, unless God gives permission? And like in the story of Job in the Old Testament, when God removed the hedge, and he allowed Satan to do certain things to Job and certain things he couldn't do. And all that had a purpose to it, to, to, to demonstrate what genuine faith is like, how it reacts in the most severe trial that any person could ever go through. If your faith is real, you're not going to quit on God, no matter how severe the trial is. And then we also see that in the New Testament, remember in Luke chapter 22, when Jesus said to Peter, he said, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to have you. In other words, Satan's asking permission to get at you. You understand that? But I pray for you that in the end that your faith will not fail. In other words, I'm going to allow Satan to sift you because in the end it's going to actually work to your sanctification and good. And when all this is over with, you strengthen the brethren is what he said. And then the apostle Paul himself. We're studying 2 Corinthians on Sunday morning. And when we get to chapter 12, Paul will talk about the thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan sent to buffet Paul. And three times Paul prayed and said, Lord, remove this thorn. And God said, no, my grace is sufficient for you. Those are positive outcomes, but there's also times in Scripture when God will deliver a person over to Satan, and it's not with a positive outcome. It's with the idea of punishment. It's the idea of judgment. And we just read of that in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And this is what Paul is saying right here. And we also get an illustration of this in the Old Testament of Saul. Remember Saul who disobeyed God and how he was delivered over unto Satan because of his disobedience at that time? And here is another illustration in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 20, of two men that have blasphemed, they have taught the wrong thing, and they are perhaps are apostates or men who are professed to know Christ. They could be believers. They may not be. There is indication that they're probably not. But if they are, regardless, Paul said, I've delivered these men over unto Satan for, um, for punishment. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5, for the destruction of the flesh. If a person is truly saved, they're out from under the umbrella of God's protection in the church. Their body might be die, they, their flesh may be uh, taken by the devil, but their spirit will be saved, their soul will be saved, if they're truly a believer. But 
regardless, this is what Paul does here with this. And what, what do we learn from this? There are times when we have to confront firmly sin, false teaching, false doctrine. We don't let that go. We don't turn our head from that. It has to be dealt with. We have to confront the enemy when the enemy comes. And that's what Paul is saying to Timothy. Confront this false doctrine. And he uses this as an example. Again, Timothy was left there to charge some that they teach no other doctrine. And Paul said, remember, Timothy, I've delivered two on this, uh, over on the Satan, that they might learn not to blaspheme. And so to be a good soldier, as we wrap this up, we have to remember our duty. We have to keep a good conscience. We have to be willing to confront the enemy biblically the way the Bible tells us. It's not pleasant. But that's part of what we're called to do. And again, this, this couldn't be easy for Timothy, and yet Paul's exhorting him to be a good soldier. I heard about a little boy who went to his first day of first grade, and when the clock hands reached 12 noon, he got up and got ready to go home. And the teacher there decided to take a positive approach. So she said to him, you know, in kindergarten, you had to stay till 12 noon, but now that you're in first grade, you get to stay all day. And the little boy looked with shock, looked at the teacher and said, who signed me up for this anyway? That's probably how Timothy felt. He had this huge task of confronting false teachers right there in that church, probably a younger man, and he probably felt that way at times. Who signed me up for this? And there might be times in your own Christian walk when you there's a difficult duty or something hard, and you might be thinking, man, who signed me up for this? Well, let me tell you who did. The Lord did. And the moment that you became a child of God, you entered into the army of the Lord, and God has called you to be a good soldier, to war, a good warfare. Engage. Serve. Be willing to confront, to fight the good fight of faith. God's called us all with that. Let's, let's bow for prayer together tonight. And Father, again, we are so grateful for your word. We're so grateful, Lord, that we don't have to wonder what the orders are. Because, Lord, as your word tells us, you are our commander-in-chief, and you make your orders very clear. This is what you want from us. This is what you expect of us. So, Father, help us. Like Paul said to Timothy, may we apply this to our own life. May we take what Paul said to Timothy, may we take it personally. May we apply it to us. And, Lord, may we follow these same orders as we seek to be good soldiers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to remember our duty and be faithful to it. Lord, help us to keep a clean conscience, keep our sins confessed, to stay in the Word of God, to educate ourselves in the Scripture and be yielded to the Holy Spirit. And Lord, may we be willing to confront the enemy whenever there's that need, whenever it's necessary. Lord, for your glory, for the protection of your people, for the honor of your Son, for the good of your work, your church, that we might be the pillar and the ground of truth that you've called us to be. So speak to our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in hearts and lives. And we pray in Jesus' name.